Hello and welcome to the show with me, Gillian Gossel. Today I have a really interesting guest. His name is David Harney and he's with, well, he was with Irish Life when I met him first and now, that's only a month ago, and now he's been promoted again. He's president and CEO of Europe with the Great West Life Co. Welcome to the show, David. Yeah, thanks very much, Gillian. Yeah, so when we met, you were uh, CEO of Irish Life and I didn't know this was happening. So in the, in the four weeks since we've met, uh, you've been promoted. So what's the new job like? Um, well, just settling in and yeah, there's not much happening at the moment with uh, stock markets uh, plummeting yeah. and uh, coronas, coronavirus <laughs> taking over. So it's an it's a interesting time to be taking charge. Um, uh, but you, but yeah, I'm still, very, I'm still very much connected, connected with Irish Life. Uh, I suppose Great West have three businesses in Europe, obviously Irish Life here in Ireland, Canada Life in the UK and Canada Life in Germany. So we've about... 3,000 employees here in Ireland and maybe 6,000 employees in Europe uh, overall. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to the new role and just overseeing the, the three businesses. I was going to ask if you were jinxed because I was reading back and I see you took over as the head of corporate in 2007 and then look what happened. Yeah. <laughs> 2020, yeah. You, you've got the corona. Yeah, maybe I'm bad luck. Yeah, we were on a good run since I took over Irish Life three and a half years ago. So it doesn't it doesn't happen every time. <laughs> no, and, and I see also in the reports that you've turned stuff around tremendously, even even though you faced into big uh, challenges. Um, and it was, yeah. we were just saying before we started recording, you're also a lifer. You, at se- age 17, you joined Irish Life. Yeah, all my career has been in, in Irish Life. So um, I... I joined uh, straight from secondary school, um, so I joined the, the actuarial apprentice scheme here. Um, and, you went in yeah, the mail room then? Well, I wasn't in the mail room, but yeah, uh, I suppose, yeah, it was it was the actuarial apprentice scheme. So yeah, and I, I worked in, in lots of different roles uh, just throughout my time here. So yeah, it's been, wow. a, it's been a great day for me to work in. Yeah, no, congratulations. So now the reason why we connected was that you gave a talk uh, to Blockchain Ireland Group last month, a very interesting talk on identity. And I want to touch on that today. But before I, I, I jump into the meat of the, the conversation, will you be, you said at the very, before you start, started uh, recording, are you also going to stay very much involved with this project, even though you've got this new role? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like I think, the, I think this has huge potential. And I suppose we're looking at it as a national project here in Ireland. Like, I think Ireland is, is I think it's a country that's well suited uh, maybe to getting something like this off the ground. Um, but it, it's very much an international uh, problem and there's lots of people looking at it in different countries as well. So, um, you know, if we can solve it here, we'd be looking to share that experience with other countries and Perfect. you know bring it on to the European agenda. Well, I'm glad to hear it because projects like this always need champions. So if you were going to go away, I was going to go, oh, it wouldn't be very good for the project. So yes, I'm delighted that you're staying on. So let's talk about the project. It's codenamed Emerald, and it's about identity. And perhaps can you start off by distinguishing what you understand between identity and credentials? Um, yeah, so I suppose we, we talk about identity a lot, and identity is a very uh, intrinsic thing. Um, so I suppose when I was talking at, at the blockchain event you, you know your identity is what you get when you're born so you are who you are because you exist so without getting too deep on it you know so your identity is, is just a very intrinsic thing but uh, I suppose as you exist and operate in the world what you carry around are our credentials so the first credential you get is your name and um, from from your parents um, and you, you get a birth certificate uh, and you carry that around show who you are and then as you live your life you build uh, lots of, of different credentials and I suppose the credentials we rely on mostly in our day-to-day lives are things like our driving license um, our passports we may have educational qualifications and things like that um, so they're, they're what we call credentials and I suppose it, it's credentials that we use to to prove our identity um, so credentials are the most important uh, thing the great thing about credentials like say a driving license or a passport card or a passport book that you carry around is you, you get to use them on a day-to-day basis um, you're in full control uh, you own them and um, if you share them with somebody else there's no big brother uh, tracking that um, so in the digital world we call that a sort of self uh, sovereign experience self sovereign mean you, you you fully own the sharing of those credentials and there's nobody tracking it and I suppose what we're trying to do in the digital world is is recreate that experience so can people carry around digital uh, credentials and have ownership of when they share those credentials and 
even though they're sharing them in the digital world, that it's impossible for anybody to track uh, the sharing of that. Okay, so in the current landscape, how would you interpret the data that we carry with us as self, corporate, societal? It's kind of all sort of messed up. And then when you want to prove who you are with your credentials, you've got to go through the whole process. So how would you describe that current system? Well, it's very messed up. So, and I suppose people talk about, like obviously the internet uh, took off uh, many years ago and has been a fantastic uh, success. But um, it's interesting just when that built, there there wasn't um, there wasn't a solution around digital identity uh, uh, and people ignored it. But but it, it is a big problem now because you know just we all know um, we we have we all personally have lots of passports that we get our passwords that we get mixed up and find it very difficult uh, to track. Um, the other thing then as well is like just corporates themselves store a lot of personal data and they have to spend, you know, tens and hundreds and, maybe, and billions actually worldwide are protecting that data. Um, so I suppose we've the personal experience with passports, but then we have all of the uh, money uh, corporates are spending on, on protecting data. So the World Economic Forum, um, they've done estimates that, you know, there's probably somewhere between 3% to 13% of global GDP each year is is just wasted expenditure on inefficiency of people being able to prove who they are and the work that corporates have to spend on storing uh, data safely, you know, so I suppose self-sovereign uh, digital credential infrastructure is potentially just a much better uh, approach to that. And before we delve into the actual project, um, what about things sort of in the real world again, like GDPR? Are they going to be impactfully negatively or positively on this situation? Um, positively. So I think like GDPR, again, would be a big uh, motivating uh, force uh, behind this. And, um, you know, I suppose the self-sovereign principle I, I touched on earlier on is that you have full ownership of your credential and if you share it with somebody you effectively get to do that uh, privately um, so that probably even goes beyond what GDPR is is um, is trying to promote or, or trying to protect uh, for people so yeah so I'd see sort of South Sovereign as the next level up actually um, from GDPR. That's interesting so now Irish Life you're leading the push here in this Emerald Identity uh, Solution um, why? Why Irish Life? Why you? Where did that come um, from? I don't think particularly about Irish Life. You know, it's like, I think it's. I think in most countries you'll probably see it will come from financial services. Um, that they'll be sort of advocating solutions here. Um, I suppose all financial services companies. We spend a lot of money just onboarding our customers. Um, because there's just strong requirements uh, that we have to validate uh, who people, uh, who they say they are. Um, so we all spend a lot of money onboarding customers. And then, you know, we all spend a lot of money then uh, verifying uh, people are who they say they are when they come back to say claim on, on insurance and stuff like that. So I suppose we started looking at were there ways that we could um, onboard uh, people uh, more efficiently um, so most it saves us uh, administration costs but it also improves the the customer experience uh, when they're when they're becoming a new customer of Irish life but we very quickly got into the space there's no point in a single company building out a solution here um, and you know even there's no point in a group of financial services companies uh, getting together to build out a solution here. So really what you need to do is to try and bring together uh, a number of different industries and also uh, the government because they're the, they're the main supplier of credible credentials and see together can we build an infrastructure where people can share uh, credentials and then everybody can benefit uh, from it. So two questions from what you've just said there. First off, who are the other organisations? Can you name them that are getting involved in this initiative? And secondly, why is government not leading it? Um, yeah, there's a number of different companies involved. So um, I, I don't know if they mind me sharing their, their names or not. Um, but I suppose we've had help from ANL, Goodbody and Deloitte's, um, AIB, Unpost, um, you know, Vodafone, Fexco, different companies like that have been involved. So we're, we're forming a, a coalition at the moment. Um, we've had very good discussions uh, with the government. Um, again, so I suppose they, they, have, they have different uh, groups in there. Um, again, they're very interested in the agenda. Um, 
they're very supportive, I think, of the agenda. Now, again, this is all just starting off, and I suppose people are coming together uh, informally at the moment. There, there hasn't been a, a sort of corporate organisation set up to lead this yet, so I think that's something that might happen later on in the year. I think the government are probably a little bit slow to lead out on it, and I think that's right. I suppose they don't want to be seen... I suppose they're maybe a little bit fearful if they lead out on this agenda, it'll be seen some way as a sort of data controlling agenda or something like that. Um, you know, so I, I think they're just being thoughtful on, on how they on how they engage on it. Okay, um, the principles of the identity solution you um, talked about them, and some of them are very interesting. They're, they're very um, high high ground principles like social good, trusted, not for profit. Why do you think it's important to place the principles of this solution at that level as opposed to a commercial product you could sell or something? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because like lots of things work very well because they're based on uh, commercial principles. Um, but I think the debate with data is, um, and I suppose like the core principle here is really the, the self-sovereign uh, principle. So people own, own the data, it's private, uh, and they get to share it uh, privately uh, with, with other people in, in a very secure and trusted framework. So I suppose if you take that, the, the credentials or the data can't be commercialized in any way because nobody will have sight of it. So that, that's just going to be impossible to do. Um, you know, so really what we're trying to do here is, is create a, an infrastructure. And if it's to adhere to those self-sovereign principles, I, I just don't think there can be commercialization of it. So, you know, it's, it's a bit like building roadways or canals or, uh, pipes for electricity to travel around on or whatever you know so once we build the infrastructure credentials can be shared um there'd be lots of commercial gains from it for from different people like industries should be able to operate more efficiently in that so you know i think you know so i think where that gets you to is industry and government need to come together to um create the infrastructure and allow credentials to be shared and then the benefits if you like are, are secondary or come off it. Okay. Um, as part of that, I know you uh, mentioned standards are very important, uh, looking to international standards to get best practice, but you're also basing it on emerging tech and blockchain. Can you tell me what the importance of blockchain is to this project? Um, yeah, well, blockchain, explaining blockchain now isn't too easy, but I suppose blockchain is an infrastructure that just allows um, things to be stored in a very safe way and, and verified in a, in a very safe way. So it's, it's built on um, cryptography uh, technology. So effectively, it's, it's a ledger where um, things are cryptography signed and then can be verified uh, by other users. Um, now, the way we use blockchain on this is the credentials are not stored on the blockchain. The blockchain is just uh, used to verify that a credential has been signed uh, by a valid uh, issuer of, of that credential. And that's something that a relying party uh, can use on. So, you know, the credentials are stored. The idea is that the credentials would be stored in uh, people's um smartphones and uh, the, the blockchain then would be just used to verify that that it's a valid credential. So I think that the core technologies here are well, cryptography, first of all, um, and then, you know, the other one is, is just the smartphone, like the, the, this couldn't operate uh, without smartphones, if you like. Um, so I think key principle is data isn't being held uh, centrally by any organization. Um, you know, the credentials are are dispersed, if you like, into people's individual smartphones and then the, the, the blockchain type technology is used just to verify that the credentials are valid credentials. Okay, so on your roadmap, you have a slide that would said uh, coalition, which you're building, informal as yet, mobilize and then also implement pilots. Can you tell me finally, David, what about pilots you think would be the first ones that you see expect to see rolled out and in what time frame? Yeah, our ambition would be to have a, a pilot uh, built uh, this year um, and that would uh, use some government, say maybe mock uh, government uh, credentials. Uh, so that might be a driving license. It might be a, a mock version of my Gov ID, um, you know, so, you know, that we would set up a, a, a digital wallet uh, uh, that would carry those 
um, credentials on it and then that there would be use cases that industry uh, would build that, that would be using those credentials. Um, you know, so I suppose a simple way would be we'll have built, say, a digital wallet. It will hold some uh, digital version of credentials we sort of all are aware of and say a company like Irish Life then would build a use case that would use those digital credentials to maybe onboard a new customer. So, Brilliant. You know, yeah, so I'd hope at the end of this year we'd have prototypes built that would show uh, how this would work. Very exciting. Well, thank you very much in your, indeed for your time. We've been listening to David Hardy, who is the President and CEO of Europe of Great West Life Co. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much, Gillian.